evening, good evening, good evening. Family, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Welcome to the family members who are here. Welcome to the family members who are watching us virtually. Welcome to another dynamic hour of power with Champions for Christ International Ministries. Amen. Yes. Where our spiritual parents are, Dr. William A. Wynn and Lady Rita Wynn. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start this impactful hour off right. And we're going to start by reciting our vision. So, family, whether you're here or watching us virtually, please repeat after me the vision of champions for Christ. is to fundamentally strengthen a community by empowering each individual through caring, feeding, and protecting them through the word of God. Amen, amen. Now, let's recite the mission. So again, please repeat after me. The mission of Champions for Christ is to restore the fallen, seek the lost, and ensure the spiritual health of the community through biblically educating, empowering, and inspiring the people to walk in the purpose that God has commissioned for their lives. Amen, 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 family. Amen. And like I always say, that is the blueprint that we must follow, that must emulate in our daily walk. Amen. Amen. Tonight's reading is going to come from Psalms, chapter 118, and I will be reading verses 26 through 29. And the word of God reads, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So if we are saying that we are children of the most high God, we got to praise him. We have to exalt his name. We have to worship him. Amen. Because as he said, his love for us will endure forever. Amen. Amen. So let us go before the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious and heavenly father, we come before you right now in the mighty name of Jesus to say thank you. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that you showered us with unmerited favor and blessings, oh God, as we were going to and from our destinations today. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that you order our steps and you directed our paths, Lord God. And even once we deviated from that path, Lord God, you made our crooked path straight, Lord God. And for that, we want to say thank you, Lord. Father, we ask you right now, Lord God, that you fill this place with your presence, oh God. Father God, fill it where it is so strong, where burdens are removed, yokes are destroyed, Lord God, and the captives are set free, Lord God, so that they may praise and worship, Lord God, so they may exalt your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Father God, we ask you right now, Lord God, to till the grounds of our hearts, Lord God. 
because the word that is coming forth, Lord God, we are decreeing and declaring, Lord God, that it will fall on fertile ground and it will take root, Lord God. And once it take root, Lord God, it will energize us, oh God, to continue to go out and compel others to come, Lord God. And for that, we want to go ahead and say thank you, Lord. But Father God, we ask you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God, to bless our spiritual parents, oh God. Father God, continue to build a hedge of protection around them, Lord God. Father God, we thank you right now, Lord God, that no weapon of any kind that has been formed against them shall prosper, Lord God. And Father God, we decree and declare right here and right now, Lord God, any thought any tongue that rises up against them, oh God, it is condemned in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. But Father God, as our spiritual father comes before us tonight, Lord God, Father God, increase in him, Lord God, while he decreased. Use him, Lord God, as your mouthpiece, oh God, to minister to your people, Father. And Lord God, when it is all said and done, oh God, we will be sure to give you all the praise, oh God. It is in Jesus' holy and matchless name, and it is so. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. tonight to God be all the glory honor and praise for truly he is worthy to be praised I want to thank God for who he is and not only my life but all of our lives that we truly serve a God that can do anything but fail And it seems like the closer you get to him, the more bad news you, you hear periodically. It seems like the more you're trying, it seems like the more Satan's flying. Every time you turn around, it seems like somebody's getting sick or ill. Somebody's in the hospital. Somebody's dying. And it seems like it's just becoming a lot closer and more rapid than it was when I was growing up. But then I look and see at how sin has become forever present. And it has, been, has, it has taken a precedence in people's lives where they enjoy sin more than they do being saved. And so where does sovereignty begin? If there's any sovereignty left, and I know there is because there'll always be grace, but sometimes it seems like you just can't feel it. Seems like you just can't see it, can't touch it. Sometimes it seems like you're just in a different place. But I'm glad tonight that God said he'll never change. I'm glad that he's still a doctor that heals and that he still delivers. Keep Minister Chisholm in your prayers after he had to have emergency surgery today. Keep him in your prayers. I always say, and I find myself saying it more now, Leah, for today, for tomorrow's not promised and you can't do anything about yesterday. You have to make this moment I don't know why we carry madness and, 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 you know, situations from your job or those kind of things. Those are unnecessary weights. They hurt you. They destroy you. They're designed to destroy you because they're anti-Christ utensils or materials. And yet we, we find ourselves in situations where we can go everywhere else but church. We can do everything else, find a babysitter, find somebody to take care of whatever for you, to go to anything but, but God's house. But the day is coming. The day is coming where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. 
But some of us are going to be going different directions. There are only two directions you go on this road, either up or down. And I'm working hard to make sure that I'm one of those that's caught up in the number. I don't want to be left here and trying to get through Armageddon. I don't want to live through that. And I, that's, I, it's tough enough as it is. So I challenge everybody tonight to make sure that you continue on the road of righteousness, that you continue to find a way to encourage yourself. Don't put God on the back burner. For those who are watching on television tonight or listening by way of radio on your way here, on your way home from work, please make up in your mind this day who you shall serve. Because things are happening rapidly. They are happening quickly. Before you can turn around, it seems like things are happening. And we find ourselves doing one of two things, First Lady. Either we're singing sad songs or we're asking God for something. We're singing sad songs, slow walking, or we're asking God for something. That's what the world has come to. That that's how we see our God. That even he's going to give us something or answer a prayer. And we've gotten to the point to where we don't shabak his name no more. We don't cry holy unto him. We don't, we don't go hallelujah. We don't lose ourselves for him, but we'll lose ourselves for Beyonce. We'll, we'll lose ourselves for some type of other event out there. We'll lose ourselves for a party. But we won't lose ourselves for God. What is the world coming to? Why is it so hard for us to be relentless for God, but we're relentless for everything else? You got perfect attendance on the job. You don't miss work. You're early for work. And you never get to church but once a month. There's always an excuse for why we can't enter into the house of the Lord and fellowship with our sisters and our brothers. And it seems like not only... Uh, the world is changing, but I look at our culture individually. We are not even the other no more. We are uh, just, just, you know, just a part of a pot now. We, we used to be the other. It used to be Caucasians, then African Americans, and then we moved on down, and Hispanics moved up, and now we're sinking on even more because most of us are dead in jail or cracked out. But that still won't bring people to church. That still won't cause people to build on behalf of the Lord. It causes us to turn to the world's ways. But I want to talk tonight about Solomon, continue our discussion from last week on how he started great but ended miserably. He started great but ended miserably. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this hour of power that you speak through me to these, your people. Thank you for the prayer that went forth earlier. We're going to ride it out tonight. And for this, we give you glory, honor, and praise that everyone who have an ear, let them hear. Whoever has a heart, let them receive what thus says the Lord through me. Use me as a vessel tonight, Father, in your son Jesus' magical name. Somebody shout amen. Are you focused? Are you focused. You can go ahead and sit down because I, this is a lot of reading tonight. I want y'all to take notes. I was on small group last night and we had a beautiful small group last night and one thing I'm saying is start taking notes at church. Do not come to church to be entertained. Jesus did not die to entertain you. He died to save you. If I can pay to be entertained, then that's not what Jesus do because what Jesus did, we couldn't pay for that. He died for our sins so that we might live and we still pay him one thing, no attention. We pay him no attention and yet we, we wait and, and, and wait on him to do these marvelous, these, these miraculous, marvelous things for us and we never pay him any homage. I'm, I'm basking tonight in thought on how did we get here? How did we as people start out so prominent and so focused and so good, and then we turned out so bad? Because we all in school, when we're young, we all have big aspirations. 
Most people in these classes, when they're young, they want to, well, when we was in school, they wanted to be a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, or a preacher, something um, that was going and giving back to the community. Nowadays, everybody wants to be a rapper, a drug, a drug dealer, or be on welfare. How did we get here? And there's nothing wrong with assistance from the government if you're moving. If you're moving forward, that's fine. But I'm talking about these people who have become stagnated. They started getting it, and the getting was good, and they figured, I don't have to do anything now. How do we get to the point to where we remain focused? Solomon here in the text, I'm going to start reading um, from verse 6 for the sake of time. The first, is, the first five verses talks really good about Solomon, how he had finished the temple and how he had finished his house. And it was good during that time that how he did that. And God was even well pleased with him. And God said, because of that, God named it after him. He said, uh, the temple shall be mine. And from that point, God really don't care about Solomon's house, although Solomon put more money into his own house. I'm reading tonight from, from 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to paraphrase it for the sake of time. So the first five verses talks about the goodness of Solomon and how Solomon was very prudent in building not only his house but the temple from God for God and it took 20 years to do this 13 years for Solomon to build his palace and seven years which is right seven is the number of completion it's been seven years for him to build the temple and God said I'm well pleased with that that's fine I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. And now because of that, I'm going to name this after me. And God goes all down the line talking about how well and how established his royal throne over Israel would be. Now, this is nothing new because Solomon's daddy's name is David. So, so this is nothing new. His dad has already reigned, been the king of Israel. He's coming behind his daddy. The other brother thought they was going to, Epsilon and all the others thought they was going to get it, but no, it was Solomon that God saw fit through David to pass the crown on through. So, so he gets the crown because he's part of the lineage. God asked him, what is it, what do you will that I give you? He said, God, give me wisdom. God said, what? Give me wisdom. Not money, no. Not women, no. Not wine, no. Give me wisdom. Stop asking God for a car. Ask God for finances. We, we prayed, and I've done this. Listen, I've, I've done this. We pray, God, give me a house. God, give me the, re the resource, and the, and the resource will bring the revenue so not only I can get this house, but I can get another house. I can get another house. I can continue to get houses and help my family out and other people out. No, we pray the wrong things because we pray selfish prayers like Jacob. Listen, Jacob was selfish. Jacob lost focus. Jacob was all about Jacob. Yes, he was. He was selfish. He was the epitome of selfishness. He didn't care about nobody else but himself until God got him straight. God got him straight by telling him the things that you get on this earth has nothing to do with who you are. It has everything to do with the grace I provide, Jesus. Some, somebody got to be saying that now because I don't know how I got what I have, but I know it wasn't because of what I make. My job couldn't allow me to get what I got off of what I make. It had to be something greater. It had to be what God told Jacob that it's the way. It, 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 it's the grace that caused me to get there. And when he told Jacob that, that it was nothing about Jacob, it was always about God's grace, something happened. He, Jacob became refocused. And we know the story of Jacob from there on, but this is not about Jacob, this is about Solomon. Tell a neighbor, this ain't about Jacob. This is about Solomon. Now tell him, this ain't about you. This is about God. Okay, they might not sit with you no more, but that's okay. That, that's all right, that, that, that's okay. I, I looked it up. Biblically, King Solomon's net worth today 
would be $2.1 trillion. Trillion dollars. $2.1 trillion. Can I get an amen? $2.1 trillion. That equals the 400 richest Americans in Forbes. It would take the 400, it would take 400 of the, the wealthiest 400 people in Forbes to equate or to be the equal to what Solomon was worth. $2.1 trillion? Today, he was worth $2.1 trillion? You're talking about a legacy because his dad was right behind him at like 990 some billion. Oh, okay, lineage. First lady lineage. David was wealthy too. But David didn't care about wealth quite like Solomon. David didn't care. In fact, the Bible tells me that when David got ready to die, he was getting sick. The first thing David said, take my money and build a temple for God. That's what he said. Take my money and, and build a temple for God. He died, and now comes his son, who has the same spirit because he's in the same bloodline, and now he do what? He go and build a new temple along with his house. $2.1 trillion. And I was wondering, I'm saying, how did Solomon get so rich in such a time? It says that, that King Solomon invested in assets he could feel. King Solomon, let me say this to those watching. King Solomon, he invested his money, not blew it, invest his money. In other words, he put his money, sold his money into something that he can get a great return. He said he sold his money only into things he could touch. Jesus. The four things that he sold into and he invested in was first, Precious metal, gold, silver. That's what he invested in, gold. Gold will be here longer than money ever will. Your Bible says that gold will be here longer than currency. So he invested in it way back then. He invested in gold, in precious metals. Number two, he invested in what all of us need to invest in, land. He invested in land because we all know that one thing you cannot reproduce is land. I'm, I'm trying to get us away. I'm trying my best to get us away so you don't have to go and pray a prayer that's already been answered. Where shall I put my money? You should put it in gold. You should put it in land. Number two, number three, he put it in transportation. <laughs> he, he invested in transportation when there was no Petro. James, he invested in he invested in, in gold and metals, he invested in land. Number three, he invested in transportation. Yeah, camels, donkeys, and horses. He he invested because he could touch them. And he saw there was a need for him. We have made this too hard. I have anyway. Let me speak for William. I've made this too hard on what I need to invest in. It's simplistic. Because the things he invested in are the things right now that take residence over everything else. Right now, they got a strike going on up in Detroit because of transportation. Yeah. Land has always been what war has been about. I need some. And, and, and about three or four years, right before the pandemic came, everybody was trying to sell gold. Everybody was trying to sell and get you to buy gold. Because why? It had been stated in the Bible. King Solomon did it. That's how he got wealthy. Not rich, wealthy. There's a difference between rich and wealthy. We're talking about a man who was wealthy. Yeah, wealthy is totally different from rich. And the last thing that he invested in was livestock. That's what made Solomon wealthy. From his sowing. From what he invested in. Livestock, 
transportation, land, and metal are the four things that made him the wealthiest man in the world. God spoke it into his life. He said, there'll never be another wealthier than you. But he had to go and work it. God spoke it into his life. You have a gift. Because you asked me for wisdom, I'm going to give you the exact thing that's going to make you wealthy. He, he, he asked for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. And with the wisdom that God gave him, he utilized it to understand these four things. Livestock, transportation, uh, land, and what else? Uh, gold, metal, to become wealthy. See, we ask God for things, and we expect them to fall out the sky. Dorothy is paramount pictures. That's Hollywood, where you clap your heels three times and you're back in Kansas. I'm thinking, who ever want to go to Kansas? No, this is the real deal right here. When you ask God for something, make sure you ask God for the very mechanism that can reproduce and pregnate things to come out that will cause, will cause wealth to come to you. Yeah, you, you, we, we ask for simple things. Give me a car, God. Why we don't never ask, Lord, give me a wrecker? Yeah, give me a wrecker truck. Because if I get the wrecker truck, I can go out there because one thing for sure, car's going to break down. <laughs> wreck's gonna happen. I hate to say it, but, but wreck's gonna happen. And if I use that record truck, I can start carrying the same things that I'm gonna buy off of the truck that I got over and over. Help me say it, and over and over. I can continue to reproduce. He bought things that could, he could reproduce, or he purchased things that are even more relevant that you can't reproduce. It's one thing to buy things that you can reproduce, like livestock. That's good. Transportation. You can continue to build camels back then through allowing them to keep having babies and sheep and all that kind of stuff. That's good. But land? You can't buy land. You, there, there, there's... There's no free land out there nowhere now. The government has taken land for themselves, but outside of that, there's no land nowhere. And right now, people used to hold on to land for generations. Now they're selling land like people sell lemonade during the summertime. It's everywhere. They sell it. it because you know what? Because it's not the people that purchased the land. It's the people who purchased it down the line, people who get it and they don't want to have nothing to do with it. That's how they're buying all these houses now from uh, people of color. Because grandmama done bought that house and it wasn't the biggest house in the world, but it was nice, but it was in the right place. Jesus Christ. Jesus. The, the house was in the right place. And now they left that house to you. And you look at it and the first thing you say, you look around and say, I don't want this house. And somebody else look at you and say, I'm going to capitalize off their ignorance. Because they should have been like Solomon and prayed to God and asked for wisdom. Jesus. I appreciate you, Sister Bear. She, she's the only one standing up with me tonight. That's okay. We're going to get this done tonight. I'm going to make that devil mad tonight with the God that's in me. Because he don't want me to preach this. But it's the truth. We ask for cars instead of things that can continue to reproduce. I heard this millionaire, this wealthy Asian guy had to be about 40 years old. And he said, how did you get so wealthy? He said, I don't buy nothing without having something else outside of what I make now to pay for it. So he said, if I want a Lamborghini, I have to create another business that can pay for the Lamborghini. So here's how he starts getting wealthy. He say, see, once I pay the Lamborghini off, I'm done with the Lamborghini, but the business continues to produce 
and now I don't have a note, Jesus Christ. Let, let me make this simple for somebody out there tonight who at home has sleep. It's like once you get a method and the way you find a way to pay for your child's tuition, <laughs> somebody go get up on it. Once, once that child, you got that second job right now, or you got, but you're working on a business, once that child graduates, that business should still be producing, and now I got additional wealth coming in. Solomon was wealthy. He had things that people couldn't reproduce, are things that could reproduce themselves. He said, if they can reproduce themselves, I, I never go broke. But what he didn't realize was God didn't care about wealth. God was so excited and ecstatic because he, he said, God, give me wisdom. He, oh, I got, to get, I got something for you. God didn't even ask, ask him or talk to him or converse with him about putting his name on the temple. God was so happy that he built the temple. God went on to put his name on there anyway. When God go beyond you and do something for you, there's something great in you. Now, now let me, now I want you to clap on this because when he don't allow some things to happen for you because he know they're not no good for you, then you need to praise him just as hard for that too. I know she was fine, but she was a trickster. She was tricking, had been tricking before she met you. She'd been tricking since she got with you, and she's going to trick after you leave her. Once you quit her, she didn't care. You never got a phone call from her again. Why? Because it was never you. What really prompted her was the fact that she enjoyed tricking. Yeah, that's how people get the feeling, sir. You, you fell in love with, with somebody who don't know love. Chasing all around. Chasing all down. Spending your last little bit of money. And she don't care about you. She care about tricking. You want to know where people are in life? You don't have to ask them. Just watch them. Watch how people use their money. Watch the conversation people have. I'm always trying to be around people that have great occupations. I never bring up the church. They know I'm a pastor. I didn't go to them to ask for an offering. I play golf with them and sit down at lunch with them so I can go and obtain some of that wisdom. That, that's why I do it. So that's why when I'm eating lunch, I'm sitting with a guy that's a director and a producer, does all the NBA stuff, all of the stuff for Disney, all that stuff, making this second movie now. And then I sit with this guy here who's in there too, who's Hank Aaron's um, daughter's ex-husband, but he loved Hank Aaron, loved him. He run all the Hank Aaron businesses. So the guy over here who needed money, some more money people to invest in this next movie, this guy sitting over here easily came up and said, well, I donate 100000 And then I'm sitting there, then he asked, William, you want anything else to eat? I'm good. You, you just gave me what I needed for today. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting there. Then another guy I'm sitting over there with, he's an attorney. So we get to talking about the guy who's sitting over here that runs all of Hank Aaron's businesses, we start talking about how many times he gets sued a year. But we were just guessing, how many times you get sued a year? Because he said he's, it's over like 70 Popeyes alone, not including the other businesses that he have to oversee. Over 70 Popeyes alone. He said, just Popeyes alone, man, keep me rolling. So we were guessing. So we, everybody came up with like no more than 15 times a year. He said, I wish I had that. He said, I'd do that a month. He said, I'm, I'm he said, the people I talk to the most is not my fiance, it's my attorneys. Then he was telling me how, to, how it's not really the attorneys that run it. It's the insurance companies. It's the insurance companies that really run it. And I'm sitting over there like this. I'm eating a salad because I'm trying to get right. So I'm eating a salad with grilled chicken right there. And I'm like, for real? He's like, man, it's the insurance companies. He say, the attorney can fight. He said, but they got to go back and ask the insurance company at the end. And the insurance company say, well, let's go ahead and settle out. And I'm like, how did he settle out on this case he was telling me about? They caught this person stealing out the safe with the camera, stealing, got him on camera, go to court. The attorney's ready to get at him, but they saw a glitch. And when the insurance company saw the glitch, they say, no way, because if we falsely accuse him with that glitch, He's going to sue us for millions. Offer him 20000 
I say, Victor, but he was guilty. He said, yeah, but the insurance company always look at what's the easier route. He say, with them, it's not about right or wrong. It's about how much money we can keep. I'm sitting at lunch with them. We just played golf Saturday. I'm trying to get ready to get home and watch Georgia and South Carolina play. And, 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 but but I'm, I don't got so intrigued in this conversation here about how this whole thing works. I'm sitting here like, God, you don't place me among some kings. And they always, William going to play this week? William going to play? Yeah, I'm going to play. I play with him every week now. Every week because I'm getting better at my golf game. But the knowledge that I'm getting, the wisdom, look at your circle. Look at your circle of people. Are you focused? Because if you are hanging around people who are not focused, I promise you at some point you're going to lose focus. It's hard enough to keep focused yourself, James. When you got other people that are not focused, they just get you off track. And next thing you know, they become the narrator of your life. And you wonder, how did I get over here? I'm talking just like buckwheat them now. I'm out here wearing the clothes just like them. I'm wearing whore clothes just like she wear them because I'm with that hoe all the time. We don't like this. But that's why we don't get better. Deny it. That's why we don't get better, because we go to church because we like cupcakes. When you really go to church to eat Brussels sprouts, string beans, yeah, stuff like that. Look at those watching on TV tonight. Ask yourself, who am I hanging out with that's not focused? If they're not talking about today or tomorrow, leave them alone. I can't, I, I can't, be, I can't be around dudes no more. So if they ain't talking about retirement, if they're not talking about what they're going to leave for their wife and their kids, if God called them home, if they're not talking about their next move, if they're not talking about something like that, I don't fool with them. The last thing I want to talk about is sports. I, I, don't want, I want to talk and see how you feel about how the world is. I, I want to see why you're a Democrat. You call mama number one? I want to see why you're a Republican. I just, I like to see people, what's your platform? Most people vote and don't have a platform. They don't know what's going on in this world. They just as lost as Cootie Brown. But they vote one way or another because they've been persuaded and influenced when they were young. So they don't know what's really going on. They have no control, no say so on them. They just, hey, did it win? Did my guy win? You don't even know your guy's platform. How are you going to be wealthy? How are you going to hear from God? Like Jacob, he has to turn us sometime. He has to turn our dial on focus when we're not focused. When you get to the point where everything about your life is entertained, I, I, I work too, I, all I do, I want to just be, I'm tired, I'm sitting and you know what, when you die, you don't have to worry about being tired. You have, to worry, you have to worry about being burnt and burning the rest of your time in eternity or going to heaven with golden gates and pearly gates and golden streets. Tired won't be one of them. Not if you go to heaven. Illness won't be one of them if you go to heaven. None of that will even exist in heaven. No more crying there if I go there. Why are we not working towards that? Why are we not focusing on that? Why? There's no test too hard. If one person can pass that test, that means you can pass it. Are you putting the work in? If one person can, can, can fight to remain in their marriage, you can fight to stay in yours. If somebody else got kids who are doing great in school, your kids can do great. We don't spend enough time with them because we focus on fatigue. And one thing I've learned in life is that fatigue will make cowards of us all. Fatigue make cowards of us all. When you talk, I'm tired, I can't do this. No, you got to still do it, brother. Because at that point, that's when the glory cloud starts. The glory cloud comes after you're tired, but you go on anyway. The glory cloud comes when I'm scared, I can't see my way, but I'm pressing on. I, I just put my hand out in front of me, and I just trust that God won't let me fall. That, that's when the glory cloud, the glory cloud don't come just because you think it. 
Because you know how many people think a day how great they can be? Solomon knew what he could be. That's why he spoke wisdom. Give me wisdom. We never, as a culture, our people never really talk about entrepreneurship. We have a small few that talk about entrepreneurship. And we have a lot of people now that have gone to college. And we know what they say in college, that the chances are greater of being wealthy if you work for yourself. But we still choose not to, out of fear. Are you focused? What are you focused on? It's proven, and this is something I'm starting to do, and I don't, I'm not saying do this. It's proven that whatever we need, God made. Whatever we need, God made. And I made the decision, I said, you know what, I've been taking this gout medicine since I was in my 30s early 30s. And one day my, I, I went to the doctor and the doctor said, your kidney's only working 50% of the time, Mr. Wynn. And he said, do you drink? I said, I haven't drink in 12 years. Not alcohol. Yeah, I don't think so, he said. You eat red meat? I don't eat a lot of red meat. I eat chicken. I said, what kind of chicken you eat? I fried. I like Publix chicken. I eat it twice a week. He said, you got to be careful with chicken because of the protein. Enzymes in the protein can cause a uric acid. That's okay. Blood pressure was high. I was a walking mess. I was a walking mess. I had started walking again. Once the doctor told him I was going to have to go see the specialist. So by the second time, my blood pressure, my wife went me. I was like, baby, you ain't got to go. I can go by myself. Because if, if it was some bad news, I wanted to be able to deal with it by myself and then get home at like everything was okay. But she said, I'm going with you. You ain't got to go, baby. I'm going. She didn't miss not one appointment. Then they wonder why I love her so much. Someone would have told me, just call me or text me. Call me a text me, then they would have put it out on Facebook. Uh, he all right, y'all. She went with me. She heard that her first time with the blood pressure was sky high. She was there. Came to church, kept preaching, never told nobody. Everything, the organs was looking bad. It was crazy. Kept walking. Then I started walking. Now my, my knee hurting. Knee hurting, ankle hurting. Bought some new hokas and, and still walking. I'm like, I to walk faster than this. I could walk a mile away faster. Hey, they ever want to try to make me stop. But I found a way. I kept going even through the pain because I understood that in your purpose, there will be pain. If you're purpose to do it, you're purpose to hurt through it. But you're anointed not to stop. Kept walking, kept walking, kept walking. I was down. I was up to 353. I was surprised. myself. I'm like, 353? This, this is wrong. Let me take my shoes off. I needed some type of mental satisfaction. And mama, me and my wife went back three to four weeks later. Went back to the specialist. Got back to him. He said, man. I looked at everything and the blood work and all that. I had to do all that, go and do a urine test for over 24 hours and all this crazy stuff. I said, Mr. Wynn, your blood pressure looks perfect. He said, yo, all your organs and everything looks great. I said, he said, I want to see you one more time in December. But if you do keep doing what you're doing now, there won't be no need for me to see you no more. It's just the thing to make sure you're good. That's what brought me to this sermon. Are you focused? 
Because I wasn't focused. That thing was sift you quickly through distraction so they'll get you off of what you really should be focused on. You'll start focusing on self-pity. You'll start focusing on what you don't have. You'll start focusing on why me or why not me. No. It's, it's here for me. I just got to go get it. I just got to continue to walk and bask in the glory of God. I like how I say it right here in Colossians. It says, instead of focusing on ourselves, we need to focus on things above. Paul writes this to the Colossian church because the people had started focusing on themselves instead of focusing on things above. You want to be successful more than you want to be saved. Jesus. Paul said, I got to stop this. I got to slow this down. So he wrote Colossians. The book of Colossians is for people to make sure and to ensure that they maintain their focus. Don't let nothing take you away from your focus. Don't let nothing cause you to deviate. You might have to take a time out for a minute. Make sure that you leave that car running. Don't take the key out the car. Keep the car running. So all you got to do is jump back in. Because if you take the key in the house with you, you have no need to go back outside. You I go back tomorrow. Now I'm going to leave the key in the car, so I got to go back outside. And if I go back outside, I'm going to keep that switch. And I'm going to put that thing in reverse, come out the driveway, put it in drive, and I'm going to keep on moving. Tell somebody, I got to keep moving. Are you focused? He says it right here in Colossians, instead of focusing on ourselves, we need to focus on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He said we need, we're focusing on the wrong things. We're, we're focusing on what we want rather than how we can reproduce. You want money? Learn how to reproduce it. You want love? Learn how to reproduce and give love. You want to be happy? Learn how to make other people happy. That's what it says right here in the text. That, that's exactly what it says right here in the text. He wrote that book to the saints in Kalash that is now known as the country called Turkey. So when you look at these countries, you can kind of see how Paul was all over the East, East Asia. East, he was all over Asia because Colossians is now Turkey. So it kind of helps you keep the road map. When you go over to Jerusalem, they have a, 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 a map, a, a trail you can take called the Paul Trail. And it's like a two-week trail that takes you everywhere he went. Let you know how hungry he was. Let you know how he was willing to eat off the ground. He was a tent maker. Educated as Paul was, James. His occupation was a tent. And in fact, the people started trying to feed him again. Hey, I don't want to eat y'all food. Y'all ain't living right. I ain't eating your food. Now, I don't know if we'll do that, but that's what Paul did. I don't want to eat your food. Paul went out there, got some sticks and some yarn, got some covers, and started making tents, selling tents. God will provide for you. If you're willing to walk with God and not walk with people's opinions, you'll see the hand of God. You'll see how God will walk. You'll see how God will walk before you. You'll see how he'll covet you. You'll see how he'll carry you, how he'll provide for you, how he'll be a way maker for you. But you've got to make sure you don't mind God walking in front of you. Focus. Focus. The center of interest. Focus is the center of interest. The Hawkins sing a song, Jesus, you're the center of of my joy. All that's good and perfect come from you. But it was only because he was the center of their joy. Focus is the center of interest. We have different names for it. We call it the nucleus. We can call it the cornerstone or we call it the focal point. Or some people simplistically call it the center. Focus is the center. Everything should lead to what you're focused on. So when you're reading your Bible and a term come up you're not sure about, 
your focus should remain on that center point, but you should go out and get other resources or references to make sure you understand what that is so that it can enhance the center point. That's when you really start growing in Christ. That's when you really start knowing people say some stuff, you'd be like, that's not Bible. That's not Bible. And then people ain't never read their Bible. They're the ones who will challenge you. Yes, it is. Why, 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 where you read it at? Because I haven't read that. Show me where it is now, because if I'm wrong, I want to be made right. But they can't show you. They go off of hearsay. You know how many people are trying to get to heaven off of hearsay? Hearsay what the pastor said. It would, that's why I say write down what I say. Go home and reread it yourself. So God might give you even extra revelation on what it is that demand a woman of God of preaching. Be quick to hear, slow to speak is what he said. I say be quick to read slow to talk because all I want to do is ingest and when I ingest it then I can digest it once I digest it then I can disciple then I can go out and compel others to come because I got the power of the word of God in me to lead them Solomon David's son was focused for a period of time he did great for a period of time. God kept his promise and caused him to be the wealthiest man in the world. But he didn't keep it all. It was all for a period of time. This has helped me to see that we're the author of where we go. You author the direction in which you're going. Your focus can cause you to be triumphant or experience serious consequences. If you've ever started out good with something and it turned out negative, you're going to enjoy next week's part of this. You will see yourself at some point in Solomon. How could something so right go so wrong? How could something that you knew you had it plugged, you had it nailed, and how did it slip away? I was with the right group. And they was like, what group? The group of being by myself. I let it slip away because everybody else was having too much fun. I could have been here. You hear people say it all the time, James. I could have been this. Or I should have been that. And I always say, well, who stopped you? And then they blame other people. My daddy wasn't around. What? He ain't around now, but you found a way to work. You found a way to eat. He ain't been around since. He didn't make you. God did. God knew his thoughts concerning you before you were born. They were good and out of evil, but to give you an expected end. We got to get up and be somebody. We got to do the things that will cause us to leave a lineage for those coming behind us. It can no longer be, you can no longer have the mindset of Jacob before God transformed him, that everything's about you. Who can I help today? That's what God really wants. I pray all the time, God, I speak no generational curses in my bloodline. Pray it all the time. No generational curses in my bloodline. Something else I always pray, Lord, I pray that you start to allow me to limit my regret. Allow me to start to limit my regret because regret will keep you in your past. Yeah, so what you messed up? Get back up and try again. So what? That school didn't work out. He wanted you at this school. But if he told you to go to school, keep going. Yes, no, uh, no, no regrets, man. No regrets. It's full steam ahead. Full steam ahead. Whoever's watching tonight on TV, you can be just what God has called you to be. Don't start wearing the cape of regret. Speak to those mountains. Be thou removed. Cast into the sea. 
and you will see the salvation of God. And you'll get to the point to where you are focused, as we used to say, locked, cocked, and ready to rock on what God has for you. Because what God has for you, it is for you. Put your hands together. God bless you tonight. Come on, somebody. You've just had an experience with champions, and we are so glad that you tuned in today. Let's continue to honor God through our commitment to give. There are four ways to give. You can give online via Cash App at dollar sign champions for Christ. Next, you can give online at www.championsforchristim.org. Lastly, you can give during service or on our mobile app available in the Apple and Google Play stores. Please be sure to tune in each and every week to our online broadcast. Encourage others to tune in with you. Remember, we are champions because we are champions for Christ.